name is Ilan Mano, and I am a digital diplomacy scholar at the University of Tel Aviv. Before I introduce today's event, I'd like to ask uh, Stuart McDonald to introduce the organization that's brought this wonderful panel together today. Okay, thank you very much, Ilan. Uh, my name is Stuart McDonald. I'm the director of ICR Research. Uh, we're a small independent research company uh, based in London. And uh, this is the first, and I hope the first of many events that we organize, uh, bringing people together to talk about current issues that relate to um, transnational engagement in all its forms. So I'm grateful to you all for taking the time this morning, and it's nice to see you, and I hope that we have a, a great discussion today. I'm sure we absolutely will, and thanks very much to all the speakers for participating. Okay, over to you, Alan. Thank you very much. Well, uh, welcome everyone, as I said, and good afternoon, and welcome to our uh, first event, which I hope as well as the first of many, about the metaverse and international relations. And today we will be hearing from a panel of experts, each of which will try to explore what the metaverse is and how it will impact international relations and vice versa. Okay. Before we can do that, perhaps we should take just a few minutes to understand what the metaverse is and what it is not. So at the moment, the metaverse is really a vision, a roadmap that is guiding the activities of tech companies all around the world. And at the most basic level, the metaverse will be a second plane of existence. So imagine living and existing simultaneously in two worlds. The one is physical and the other is virtual. So while commuting to work in the physical plane, you might meet up with some friends for coffee in the virtual one or while waiting for a doctor's appointment in the physical plane, you may attend the conference in the virtual one. And these two planes will coexist in real time and you will be able to move seamlessly between them thanks to computer brain interfaces. The metaverse may also be a virtual layer that complements and adds to the physical world. Imagine that you can enter a store in the physical plane and browse the various items while at the same time, visiting a second store located in the same place, but on the virtual plane. That means that all the fashionable streets in the world will be duplicated. So you will physically enter H&M in London's Regent Street, while at the same time entering a pop-up store in the virtual plane. The world will essentially be doubled. That's double the space, double the real estate, and double the experiences. But most importantly, the metaverse is supposed to be a fully immersive experience. When you go to a coffee shop in the virtual plane, you will smell freshly brewed coffee. You will hear the conversations in nearby tables and you will feel the fine oak table around which you are sitting. The metaverse will not be built on simple virtual reality, but it will be a fully simulated reality. And the metaverse will not exist in parallel to the physical world, but it will intersect the physical world constantly. So the metaverse will not be like the matrix where you enter a virtual world while being unconscious in the physical world. No, the metaverse will allow Trinity and Neo to shop for baby clothes while at the same time fighting Agent Smith inside the matrix. And there are two important points to bear in mind. First, the metaverse may constitute its own fully functioning economy where individuals may buy and sell products and services. One could invest in metaverse real estate, that virtual layer that we're adding to streets and cities. Second, the content consumed in the metaverse will be created by a host of producers, ranging from individuals to brand corporations and even activist groups. So the metaverse will essentially continue to annihilate what we know as time and space. People living in rural areas will be able to work in a virtual metropolis, or people working in major cities will be able to vacation virtually in rural areas. The metaverse will thus might bring an end to phenomenons that we know, such as work-based migration. And small countries with limited resources may exist in the virtual plane, doubling their size and doubling their economy. This vision of the, metaverses, of the metaverse raises some central questions for those studying and practicing diplomacy and international relations. For instance, Will governments join this vision or act against it? Will governments strive to create their own metaverse, which they can control in terms of content, regulation, commerce, and surveillance? Second, what about international law? What kind of laws will the metaverse require? New rules of censorship, new regulations of taxing virtual activities. Similarly, will virtual crimes be tried in the virtual plane, the physical plane, or both of them? Third, what kind of accords will be signed and will accords signed in the physical plane be applicable to the virtual realm? 
and vice versa. Already now it is hard to separate between the, between the physical and virtual worlds, but in the metaverse, this very distinction will collapse. So how will this affect relations between states? And finally, will we truly have a global metaverse or will there be a Chinese metaverse walk off by a great spiral? Now that we have discussed a little bit the vision of the metaverse and we have a vision in mind, it's time to, our hear, to hear from our panel of experts, each of, which, each of which will speak for about 10 minutes. And afterwards, we'd like to hear from you in the audience and address your questions. Our first speaker is nice. Professor Cornelio Bayola from the University of Oxford. So Cornelio, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Ilan. Um, um, a great yeah. pleasure to be here and to discuss a concept that uh, uh, I think, you know, it's in the early stage of development. Uh, it's not very clear, I mean, Ilan has pointed out, it's not very clear what metaverse at the moment is. There are different conceptions. Uh, actually, in preparation for the event today, I played for one day with my Oculus headset, you know, trying to move, you know, from different spaces, trying to understand, you know, how it works, uh, the new applications. And it is indeed, you know, fascinating in terms of the type of new opportunities, in terms of engagement that uh, this concept actually opens. But what I like to, to say uh, and to, to, uh, to, say in, in, uh, to add to what Ilan said is that from a diplomatic or, you know, uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs perspective, it would be interesting in to what extent the concept will catch on. And I think the way to think about it is to look at past waves of digital adoption by the MNP. To understand, you know, what kind of factors facilitated this transition and to what extent these kind of factors can apply, can apply to, um, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to the new medium. So let's, uh, let's look at some of the factors. So... Uh, when we look at the social media, for instance, the reason why MFAs and diplomats and embassies adopted social media has to do with the question of scale, right? We have millions of people on social media which could be reached in real time um, in various ways and in an effective way. Um, when you think about, you know, uh, Facebook, it has 2 million users, monthly users. This is a, a huge amount of, of people that we can potentially engage with. When we think about what happened during the pandemic, for instance, Zoom, Zoom at some point, you know, in April 2020, had about 300 million daily meetings, one of them, uh, one of which is today, right? Well, from this perspective, I think for the, the, the VR medium, uh, we are not there yet by any means. Um, at the moment, for instance, you know, there have been about 11 million 11 million units shipped, you know, in 2020. And in terms of the number of VR uh, headsets to be uh, sold, I mean, the anticipation is that the number will increase by, by four, you know, by 2025, we'll have about 45 million. So it's nothing comparable in terms of scale. And that, I think, is a major handicap. It may evolve, but uh, we have to keep that in mind, right? In comparing with, uh, with the previous waves, scale is small. Um, the second factor, which I think, you know, we can learn from previous waves is that uh, social media uh, evolved um, uh, as long as it uh, proved able to enhance rather than threaten established method of offline diplomacy. We've seen, for instance, the case of public diplomacy. We've seen the case of crisis communication. And I think this is also an important question to ask. Uh, in what sense the multiverse, right, the new technology could actually add uh, could contribute to um, add value to existing diplomatic practices. I think one area which, through my uh, uh, personal experience with uh, with uh, with the headset uh, in the past few days, one area in which it can uh, prove uh, quite quite effective is training, uh, because it can do a lot of gaming, a lot of simulations um, in terms of you know consular affairs, in terms of, for instance, even negotiation, crisis communication. This is an area that could provide you know, a uh, level of immersion that we cannot see otherwise, uh, not even in, 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 uh, in real, uh, real life, right? Because we can create an environment with a negotiation that is totally immersive. So that's one area. I think uh, the question of digital consulate becomes more tangible um, in a sense because uh, MFAs uh, are interested in reducing costs. So the idea of, of uh, moving some of the, of, the, of the consulate affairs online in a virtual medium may, may work. Uh, but I think another important uh, aspect remains public diplomacy. 
Um, when you think about it, I was comparing, you know, different experience um, uh, in the VR with, you know, different activities done by uh, cultural institutes. And I think all of the uh, current events done by cultural institutes can be done um, in, um, uh, uh, in VR. Attending events, learning a new language. In one of my experiences on Saturday, I started to learn Japanese and it was very immersive. Um, so it was quite, uh, quite uh, 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 easy to, to, to absorb. Um, and it was, you know, the medium was happening. The, the school was happening in Japan, so surrounded by everything else, uh, typical artifacts uh, uh, related to Japan. Organizing hackathons. So um, there is a lot of opportunity here in terms of, you know, cultural engagement and public diplomacy. I also call attention on the third factor that we learned from previous uh, uh, waves of digital adoption is the question of social ac acceptance. We have to keep in mind that diplomacy is seen as a physical activity, person to person, uh, for a variety of reasons. And one point of resistance against social media and against other technological is that they seem that you know, the value or the status of diplomatic profession is being degraded by moving uh, into the digital. And this is uh, an important point, uh, just to play on the analogy with the matrix. This is something that we have to think carefully because what the metaverse means is meaning that you have to check out of the physical reality in a more committed way than, for instance, with Zoom or with social media. You have to check out completely and to do a lot of stuff in the, uh, uh, in the multiverse. I don't think you know, many will, will, will go for this, not only because of the scale, but also because immersing yourself into the new matrix is not probably something that many will appreciate. But on the other hand, what it may, uh, what the, the, the opportunity for the multiverse may, may, uh, may be more interesting is in the AR, augmented reality. I think Ilan already hinted at that. Simply because, you know, the level of integration between physical and, and, and the virtual, uh, it's a little bit more flexible. Um, so what I like to see more, um, you know, in terms of how new applications of multiverse for diplomacy will work, I like to see, for instance, integration with AI. I think from my experience in the multiverse with my headset, um, I will appreciate to have an assistant like Alexa to guide my navigation, you know, to schedule my events, to do a lot of stuff, attending events. I think that integration with AI, I think, will be interesting. The second aspect, I think, is interoperability. Uh, I don't want to be constrained by the various uh, verses, right? In the multiverse, by the various verses. Uh, in the sense, my persona, my digital persona should, uh, should move freely between different AR or VR arenas. Uh, at the moment, this is not possible, all right? This is not possible because every platform asks you to create your own avatar, your own digital persona. So moving like a physical person from one space to another is not easy. So from this point of view, I think it's, it's something else. And the, the third point that I like to see more uh, that will make it more appealing for probably uh, uh, for the work of diplomats is uh, the, 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 the use of holographs. Um, and I think that this kind of teleportation of the persona in different environments can actually help in negotiation, can help actually public with the you know, public engagement. Um, I think the concept is interesting. So the final verdict in my case, I think the concept has you know, promise. A uh, major obstacle for me at the moment, it seems the, the question of scale, it's quite small, you know, even if, you know, you, you expand it, you know, it's nothing comparable with social media or even, you know, the, 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 what we've seen with the uh, Zoom diplomacy. Uh, but I think there are opportunities to, to, to use it, you know, for very specific, um, you know, I mentioned cultural diplomacy, public diplomacy, but also training. Training, I think it's a, it's a low hanging fruit for, the, for, for, for this kind of, of engagement. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Cornelio, uh, for that uh, fascinating intervention. I should probably remind our speakers and uh, the people in the audience for when uh, we do the question segment, the metaverse doesn't exist. The metaverse isn't even close to existing. But part of what we're asking now is if we look 10 years down the line and there is a metaverse, then how will that also impact uh, IR and uh, diplomacy? If we think about the 10 years of social media, then they certainly have jumped from very humble beginnings to having global influence. Our second speaker today uh, is Nata Dr. Natalia Grincheva from the University of Melbourne. Uh, so Natalia, over to you. Thank you. 
Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for such a lovely introduction and this invitation to be a part of this really exciting event. I would like to contribute to this uh, thought-provoking discussion with a few points, particularly from the perspective of cultural diplomacy. So indeed, metaverse platforms and technologies offer exciting opportunities for cultural diplomacy that traditionally operated uh, through two main dimensions. On the one hand, diplomacy heavily relies on the national project of various media broadcast content exchange and sharing activities that promote culture, stories, values, traditions of the country to the outside world. On the other hand, diplomacy cannot successfully operate, like Carnelo also mentioned, without cultural relations, human-to-human -human relations that are based on uh, physical interactions and sustainable uh, network building across countries. So a metaverse is a persistent virtual reality space that can combine VR capabilities and massive multiplayer online gaming technologies can offer an immersive world where users from different geolocations can exist simultaneously in a shared space and interact in infinite uh, ways by playing games, working together, shopping, strolling, watching concerts, and doing almost anything else they could do in the real world. Uh, for example, on the national projection side, Metaverse can offer a great way for cultural heritage institutions to create immersive worlds that can allow audiences to experience heritage sites, museums, collections, and treasures, as well as contemporary arts and experimental cultural spaces as never before. Museums in Metaverse world started to appear more than a decade ago when the Louvre Museum and the Dresden Gallery established their spectacular immersive 3D uh, rendering representations in the second life as early as 2007. However, the pandemic crisis has tremendously amplified these trends pushing museums to find sustainable ways to successfully operate as hybrid institutions exist in between physical and virtual worlds. For example, in the last year, many museums in Korea experimented extensively in the metaverse. In July to, uh, 2021, Podo Museum and Jeju Island opened a server on metaverse platform Zepata. And this space was used to present its new exhibition title, The World We Made, uh, that features artworks of seven contemporary artists. So over 80,000 people, in, in questions of scale, 80,000 people visited the museum in the metaverse in just one month. And there were a lot of photos that the users posted after visiting the server. Such museum visits created completely new, more customized, intimate, yet at the same time, very social experiences, bringing museum goers for a productive exchange and an enjoyable shared time to Together. On the cultural relations side, it is worth discussing the example of the Korean wave, which is now acquiring a metaverse dimension. In the past three decades, the governments invested and, and uh, efforts in going global by wielding its cultural soft power. Um, produced uh, a phenomenal growth and global popularity of Korean culture encompassing K-pop music, movies, drama, online games, and Korean cuisine, just to name a few. And most recently, the Korean wave agenda and programming opened up a new channel with the combination of virtualization. For example, K-pop groups meet with their global fans in virtual spaces to participate in different interactive activities, which offer exciting opportunities for audiences to co-create stories with their idols. In March 2021, for instance, Blackpink uh, virtual avatars held uh, a fan event in the avatar-based social media network and 46 million users, 46 million users attended the event to receive digital aut autographs from the group. The following months, uh, SK Telecom uh, launched its K-pop metaverse project, which enabled fans to create their own music videos based on girl groups group music and dances. And the group also hosted a virtual face-to-face, face-to-face -face event in May in the metaverse environment. Uh, Hype, the company behind the very popular BTS group and Tomorrow X Together and other K-pop groups has also created a popular space for fans and celebrities to chat with one another, which is called Vaverse, uh, which along with its communication function operate as a shop and also as a magazine. 
So while uh, the discussed examples illustrate exciting potentials for metaverse to offer new avenues for cultural diplomacy that can provide completely new social experiences for people across borders, there are several concerns that are worth bringing up here. For instance, last Friday, I participated in the Living Digital Heritage Conference organized by the Center for Asian Cultural Heritage and Environment in Australia. And the cultural sector has expressed very strong privacy and surveillance concerns related to human data capture and usage by corporate actors who in many cases serve as main providers of metaverse platforms. Uh, during the Artificial Intelligence Week event organized by the European Union National Institutions of Culture in late 2020, a similar concern uh, was expressed by cultural institutions and artistic groups uh, who advocated for creation a virtual civic space that in the hands of the artists and people and not controlled by big tech conglomerates that even further monopolize the global communication space. Indeed, the capabilities of mixed realities and virtual technologies that can analyze audience data are rapidly growing, raising more concerns on who and how will eventually use this data. Going far beyond a mere geolocation, demographic, and psychographic data collected in the digital media environments, VR headsets allow to collect biometrics such as eye tracking analytics, heartbeat, pulse, mouth movement capture, and even users' call cognitive load, a very specific mental state of a person. And this data provide valuable insights exposing what users are focusing on, how they perceive the environment, uh, social interaction and content, and which details generate the most negative or most positive reactions. Of course, this data have vital implications to enhance the assessment of cultural diplomacy activities and measure soft power that have always been a pretty complicated task for governments and and cultural organizations. So this explains why the South Korean government is investing in building a national metaverse, being the world's fourth largest gaming market, uh, worth near, uh, than, uh, more than uh, 60 uh, billion dollars, American dollars. South Korean conglomerates and entertainment industries are building their own metaverse. In May this year, South Korea ICT ministry announced that the country has launched an industry alliance to bolster the development of metaverse technology and ecosystem composed of 17 major IT companies. With such an alliance, the South Korea offer a unique example of the first nationwide metaverse developing in parallel with another mega large campaign launched by Facebook, who aspires to build the first global metaverse in collaboration with multiple stakeholders across borders. However, at this point in time, cultural diplomacy in the metaverse is rather operated across multiple governments and corporate stakeholders in different countries. And these efforts are disconnected and autonomous and their impacts upon audience are still much dependent on targeted countries' economic factors as well as the population digital mobility and digital literacy. So I will probably stop here. Thank you very much for your attention, but I hope I brought some very uh, important points that we can discuss further. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Many, uh, many important points. I've been scribing down questions uh, 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 fanatically while you were speaking. So thank you for that wonderful intervention. Our next, next speaker is uh, Dr. Kathleen Horn, who is the research director of the Diplo Foundation. Um, Catherine, over to you. Mm, thank, thank you so much. Um, pleasure to be here and pleasure to uh, listen to, to the two previous speakers. Um, it's very, very exciting um, to be here and to be part of this uh, conversation. Um, so at Diplo Foundation, we look at the kind of the intersection between digital and, um, and diplomacy and then focus on capacity development for diplomats from small and um, developing countries. And as part of that, the question of course arises, what about kind of future looking technology? What about new technology and its impact on uh, diplomatic practice? Uh, and if you go back to the 1990s, we might ask a question like, how could email impact the work, the working life of, of diplomats? Obviously we have seen how that played out. And a similar question perhaps arises with um, the metaverse. However, I think in order to look ahead, we also need to um, look back. And in this particular instance, I want to look back to, um, I'm trying to share my screen. 
too many things at once going on. Uh, I'm trying to look back to um, 2007. So in 2007, the Plo Foundation um, started to engage with Second Life and started to um, explore the opportunities of Second Life for diplomatic practice. What we did, and you can see a couple of pictures here on the screen, um, is to build what we call Diplomacy Island. And uh, on Diplomacy Island, there were meeting spaces and some countries um, opened virtual embassies. Um, we had a library for diplomatic resources. There was a museum of diplomacy to dive deeper into the history of diplomatic practice. There was a diplomatic training academy and then further spaces that could, could be customized for specific events to have like a virtual presence alongside the actual event. Um, the Maldives was one of the countries that opened an embassy on Diplomacy Island, and it was then followed by a Malta and, uh, and the Philippines. And really interesting back then what the perception was, what the meaning was of opening such, a, such an embassy in the virtual world. Um, the minister of the Maldives back then kind of talked about providing information, kind of sharing the Maldives' viewpoint, uh, interacting with partners. The way they built um, that particular building in Second Life was obviously taking into account um, cultural values, kind of um, model modeling it on traditional buildings um, on the Maldives. Um, let me show you a, a quick video to give you an impression of how this looked like, because we organized um, a, a number of conferences on, um, on Second Life that were hybrid, so they were in Second Life, but also um, in person. And um, this is how it looked like. Um, what I actually, in terms of zooming out and trying to understand what is the potential meaning of the metaverse for diplomatic practice, I have um, four points. Um, I'm not going to talk about public diplomacy because we heard quite a lot about that. I'm going to focus on some other aspects which I find particularly interesting. And uh, negotiation is, is kind of the key aspect here. So the question what about conducting negotiations uh, in the virtual world in something like a metaverse? And obviously the first thing that comes to mind, a huge amount of travel costs um, saved, the ability to connect ad hoc with counterparts in other countries. So for example, if there's a crisis, but, um, diplomats would be able to get kind of in the same room, kind of get a feeling for the situation, interact with each other, get a feeling for each other and negotiate. Um, Again, we can imagine something like the uh, COP26, the climate negotiations going on right now, happening virtually, kind of saving on the travel costs, saving on the environmental impact. And that sounds uh, really, really promising. Um, and also looking back at um, COVID-19 and still the situation we're in, negotiations under, under conditions of lockdown. And when we talked to diplomats about how they adapted video conferencing um, for... Um, for negotiating during lockdown, during um, kind of limited movement due to the um, COVID-19 pandemic. They were always saying, yes, video conferencing is, is a good tool, but it's like a crutch. We don't get a sense of the person. We don't get a feeling for the situation. So if you talk about something like the metaverse, some of these concerns about video conferencing, about connecting virtually might be allevi uh, alleviated. And that's a really, really interesting um, prospect. My two other points in terms of use of a metaverse for diplomatic practice are related to diplomatic training, simulating negotiations, simulating um, certain stressful situations, but also being able to perhaps immerse yourself in a different culture, um, get a better sense for different situations for people, take a, different, take a different perspective, putting yourselves in the shoes of someone else. So these might be really interesting prospects for diplomatic training. And then of course, the ways of working within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And Cornelia alluded to that, um, the opportunities of augmented reality. So diplomats um, collaborating with uh, um, other diplomats around the world using augmented realities is a really interesting prospect. Of course, and this just as a footnote, it raises the age old question, do we actually need diplomats on the ground? Do we need um, embassies? That kind of question that has been raised over and over again with each, with each new kind of technological um, innovation. Um, I don't think embassies are, um, are in any danger anytime soon. But again, the metaverse kind of raises this question, what is the relationship between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the embassies? How many people actually need to be um, 
posted to embassies. Um, from here, and this obviously just a quick overview, from here I want to kind of zoom out to ask a couple of broader questions about um, the metaverse, a couple of questions I think we need to be asking already at, um, at this stage. So one question for me that I'm not clear on, and maybe people in the audience can, can um, shed some light on that, is the idea of the metaverse as presented by Facebook, the idea of the internet as the metaverse, or is, it, is the metaverse that Facebook envisions another platform? And that's a huge difference. Um, if it's another platform, it's not a public space. It is very much governed by the rules of a specific company. And that raises big questions for diplomatic actors engaging within that space. Um, and again, the question, is the metaverse, uh, metaverse a public space? And what does it mean for the rules of engagement? Um, further questions, perhaps. What's, what's the business model we are talking about here? Is it a business model that uh, looks towards taxation and um, taxation on e-commerce transactions in the metaverse? Or is it a business model as we know it right now uh, with Facebook and other um, platforms based on data and advertising? Um, and this brings me kind of to my last point. And this is a huge debate we already had uh, in terms of video conferencing. And it kind of it's embodied by this question of do diplomats for negotiation need a purpose-built platform? So when diplomats turned to video conferencing, there were, there were quite some questions about which platforms to use, um, what are the rules of engagement, um, and what does it mean to use a commercial platform to conduct negotiations? And the same questions, I think, arise with regard to the metaverse. So um, data, security, trust, disagreements about what space to use, what platform to use. Um, and one point perhaps is that if you use the metaverse for negotiation, for example, the core of the diplomatic practice, it should be a public space, right? It should be a place that all everyone involved um, can actually trust. And then for me, that points to the question, then should states engage in building such a place, perhaps um, through the United Nations that then serves as this public space, that trusted space um, for negotiations. The current suggestion that we have on the table by uh, Mark Zuckerberg on the matter is, doesn't quite sound like that um, to me. So I'm gonna stop here and I'm looking forward to the conversation and your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for raising some very important uh, points, especially about will the metaverse be a controlled environment and who will control it. Um, it's very interesting that you started your presentation with Second Life because our next uh, speaker is Professor James Pamin from the University of Lund, who will actually research Sweden's embassy uh, to uh, Second Life, which ultimately uh, shut its doors. So James, over to you and maybe um, a better future from the, for the metaverse than Second Life. <laughs> Thanks, Ilan. Uh, um, and thank you, Stuart, for putting this together. Um, I think we're already starting to reach the point now where um, some of my points may start to overlap with the previous speakers. Um, so take that as, a, as, as uh, more confirmation of, of how brilliant the previous speakers are. And uh, so I'm going to try and address um, two questions. The first is, is there a benefit to being a first mover or an early adopter in this field for, for foreign ministries? Um, and secondly, um, if not, I don't want to give away the answer to that, but if not, when is the right time to join? Um, so in terms of the first question, you know, with, with, as with all new technology, like when is the best point to jump in? Um, and is there, any, is there any real reason to be there first? And I think we have to get used to the idea that despite Facebook's announcement, you know, there won't be a single standard for, for some time. There's going to be tremendous competition. There's going to be dozens of platforms all trying to be the next metaverse and they're going to grow in a really piecemeal way. Um, there's, there's this idea that they're a container of everything in the universe, but, but in fact, it will be the opposite. They'll start with nothing and then deal by deal, market by market, attach new things to the metaverse. So, you know, you won't be able to use your Spider-Man costume in Fortnite and FIFA until they've made those deals. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of work um, and these commercial imperatives driven by the big corporations, you know, that's what defines the first movers, not, not governments and certainly not foreign ministries who tend not to be at the forefront of, of government digital 
behavior necessarily. Um, I think we also have to bear in mind the internationally um, resistance to the idea of a single internet or a single um, approach to internet. Uh, we have increased authoritarianism as a trend. Um, we have the possibility of multiple internets or splinternets, as they're sometimes called. So we could see adoption slow, resisted, uh, lots of market by market resistance and like censorship and needing tailored altered products. So not a global thing, but something that has to be adapted to Indonesia, to local sensitivities that's different for Saudi Arabia, different for China. That's going to slow things down massively um, and kind of change some of the underpinnings of, of what we're thinking about a metaverse. Um, and then there's a huge question about data. You know, there's so much data that will be connected. I think as Natalia kind of touched upon through the headsets, like, you know, it's really interesting that Facebook made this announcement and changed their name in the midst of a trust and credibility crisis. You know, who are we going to trust? Are we going to trust these corporations to run this? Do we trust Google and Microsoft more than we trust Facebook and Twitter and TikTok? Like, who, who has that brand? Who has that credibility? And I think that may be a real sticking point for governments. There, there may be quite strong advocacy for governments to keep their noses out of this. Like, it may well be that governments are even less trusted than, than Facebook, and, you know, unbelievably, but, but that's, that's the case. Um, I think as, as Katerina touched upon, the current generation is driven by a, a, an advertising model. That's how they make money. And we can anticipate that initially advertising will drive this new generation, but then we also know from previous generations of technology that there will be a disruptor who comes along and becomes the new Google, the new Facebook out of nowhere, what will be their model of making money? Um, and I don't think anyone really can, can look in a crystal ball and guess that. So that, that will massively impact the new platform. Um, there may be a role for foreign ministries in defining international norms, but let's be really clear that in the current technological generation, norms are disproportionately is defined by the platforms and by national level regulators. MFAs have, have not been at the forefront of this. Um, platforms have been deciding what the rules are. Uh, and in fact, they, have, they still, even, even now, you know, and, and we're coming to the end of this generation, even now governments are struggling to, they don't even know what to regulate still. Um, there's, there's been a trend among these, these digital platforms, these big corporations, Facebook and so on, Google, to open, to almost see themselves as shadow foreign ministries and to open overseas posts. And they tended to recruit public affairs professionals and sales specialists at these posts. I wonder whether the need, the amount of negotiations that will be needed, the complexity of the multiverse will mean that there will be a role for diplomats in these and a what Paul Sharp calls a diplomatic approach to regulation, to the deal making, to the negotiations, which may see, interestingly enough, diplomats being involved at the forefront of this, but not actually as representatives of a country or working for the MFA, but actually as secondees or as uh, basically being stolen from, from government positions to work for industry. So in sum, I don't, I don't think it's realistic to expect the MFAs to be anywhere near the forefront, but I do think there they could be a, a diplomatic approach that, that comes at the forefront of this. So then the question, second question becomes, well, when would it be time to join? Uh, what diplomacy, public diplomacy relevant things will be going on in the metaverse? And I think we, we've already touched upon a lot of these, so I'll kind of skim through, but you know, very mundane level, Zoom meetings, work sharing, I think it will affect you know, the conduct of work for everybody. Uh, it's not a dip diplomacy specific issue. Um, there may, or there almost certainly will be an economy for virtual real estate. So there may be some kind of gold rush that means that, that you know, if you want to have a, the equivalent of a residence and an embassy in, in, in a good location, you might have to move quickly and buy into that so that you don't end up having to pay 10 times as much in, in six months time. Um, it could be quite similar to how kind of parcels of land were, were handed out in the US West, you know, a couple of hundred years ago. Um, I think there's a big question around how secure meeting spaces will be. I mean, it's easy to say you can have negotiation, you know, everyone can meet and get a better feeling for themselves. But if these spaces aren't secure, um, you, you can't do diplomacy. So 
I'm I sort of tempted to see more of a move towards like yes, there'll be there'll be more meetings, pre meetings, you know, use of AR during negotiations so that you can see the the data kind of in your in your eyes, you know, the, of what you're negotiating and so on. But I think there's also probably going to be a move towards more closed physical rooms where you leave all of your devices outside and it's just kind of humans like face to face because you're going to you're going to need those spaces where where technology doesn't have its its kind of claws dug in um, in terms of public diplomacy you know informational representational branding opportunities i mean loads endless uh, the potential for replacing existing digital media channels or complementing them um, you know, doing tie-ins, placements, advertising, audiovisual content, experiential content. Yeah, uh, clearly it's going to be huge. Will it replace embassies? I think previous generations of digital rollouts have shown that there's, there's still massive importance of being on the ground face-to-face. -face. Uh, but I think it could open up some opportunities for diplomats to get out of the capital in places where they can't necessarily travel easily these days. Um, cultural exchange, education, broadcasting, I think Natalia really, really covered that. I mean, so many opportunities, amazing intercultural, experiential opportunities, so much to gain using VR and AR, um, also training as, as Cornelia was, was talking about, you know, really profound. Um, and I think clear, clear opportunities for capacity building. So the kind of diplomacy of technical support, um, I think there'll be a, a lot of opportunities for, for diplomats from wealthier countries to support um, poorer countries, developing countries, using this new technology as a, as a kind of currency, as, a, as an engagement opportunity. Uh, but let's be clear, I think there was a question that came up um, in the Q&A, let's be clear that this new technology will not reduce inequality. Probably it will create more billionaires, um, more and give more advantages to the to the the ones who can afford to have it early on, at least until that disruption phase comes along. I think we also need to be really clear about the metaverse as a threat vector. So the idea that it will become a target for criminal and state exploitation. There are going to be tremendous opportunities for information and intelligence collection for all sorts of purposes, um, not just big data, but but deeply personal data. Um, so I think there's also a lot of opportunity for collaboration between governments around the security aspects of this, because you, you, you wouldn't be able to leave this in the hands of corporations. So in sum, um, yes, the metaverse provides interesting opportunities for diplomacy. I don't see that many benefits to being an early adopter, um, but um, certainly reasons to get involved at the right time and to be looking for when the right time is. If I'm to be controversial, I predict a brain drain of diplomats, of the best diplomats, who will glide over into industry um, and leave MFAs without their, their top people. Um, so I'll leave it there with that, on that bombshell. Uh, thanks. Thank you, James, for that very optimistic presentation. And just to add on to that, you know, you talk about government resistance, perhaps resistance is futile. After all, we now have Chinese ambassadors on Twitter. Um, so we will now move on to our uh, final speaker today, who is Francesca Vasselli, who is a doctoral research student at the University of Oxford. Please, Francesca. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, my research focuses on the use of virtual reality in humanitarian communications. So I just wanted to make a few points that I've been thinking about in my past research and also because um, I started working on VR during my master's at the LST. And I also want to tell you something about my current research. So in my dissertation, I investigated this recent trend um, of using virtual reality as a fundraising strategy. Uh, it's something that humanitarian organizations are doing more and more. And their aim is kind of to elicit an empathetic and emotional response in viewers. So um, through audiovisual analysis, I analyzed two case studies. And I, what I wanted to understand was what kind of effective connection does virtual reality seek to build between Western viewers on the one hand and uh, Global South subjects on the other. 
Um, and what I found particularly problematic was um, the argument that virtual reality has an innate ability to foster a better relationship of solidarity and of care uh, with distant sufferers. Um, so what I argued was that um, there are certain conditions that uh, virtual reality needs to fulfill in order to get closer to building that relationship. It's not just because it's virtual reality that is going to uh, make us closer. So, uh, and this also kind of adds on to the discussion about the digital divide and power disparity between global North and global South, because how, how do you use that technology to actually create a real dialogue? So what I'm really interested in is, in, is that, so how, how, do, how does virtual reality change the way we communicate? Um, and I'm currently researching VR from different angles in order to get a more all round and comprehensive picture of what research is being done. So I just wanted to speak about three different angles that I've um, identified. And I think we covered a lot of that already in the past um, interventions, but basically, like there's the first angle, it's about critical media studies and communication studies. So um, this is basically the part of research that analyzes how virtual reality has an effect on how we communicate. So it would deal with questions such as what kind of relationships and um, negotiations also does virtual reality encourage and discourage? Or uh, how do we relate to others um, through immersive media? Um, also about representational design and interaction choices and how those choices shape virtual reality experiences. Um, how should we think about those choices? And maybe is there a way in which they could be different and uh, better? Um, there is also a growing body of literature, which is the second aspect, the second uh, way to look at virtual reality, which is the sociological or social psychological angle. And that trend is more like, it's more about looking at virtual reality and how it has an impact on human behavior outside in the real world. So it deals with questions such as, uh, does VR uh, change individual behavior? Uh, there are studies that show that um, doing virtual reality experiences change the way you uh, behave, uh, for example, in terms of racism or sexism, or in my field of humanitarian communications, it seems that um, fundraising works much better. It seems like there is double the amount of donations. So I'm interested in that as well. Like, is that it? I mean, surely it's a good thing, but also like, I think we need to look better into that and ask ourselves, like, what are we, like, in what way are we um, creating that relationship? Um, and then there's the third angle, uh, which is the law and policy angle, uh, which we were speaking about a lot. And I think it's the angle where there, we will need a lot of research in the future if the metaverse vision keeps gaining traction, because obviously it's still a vision, but uh, it's about asking questions such as, um, as a new social space, how should VR and the metaverse be regulated? How uh, will we avoid the same problems that happened in social media? And will they be exacerbated in VR? Um, how do you regulate user behavior, things such as harassment and hate speech and so forth. Uh, on the question of data mining and data collection, uh, as we were saying, there's a lot of risk of sensitive biometric and physical data. Um, and there's also the question of fake news and disinformation because virtual real reality can reproduce um, very plausible versions of reality. It can also work with deep fake technology and could be a very persuasive and, and a very persuasive medium. So I think that's also something for the future, but maybe we will need to uh, be careful of it becoming kind of an ally to fake news agendas or politicized narratives. Um, yeah. So I'm very keen on applying these angles to the angle of human to humanitarian communications, because I think it is a field which, uh, almost by definition, uh, the relations between Western donors and global South subjects are mediated. Sometimes an encounter really never occurs. So I think it's, uh, it's an area where there could be a lot of transformative potential. Well, thank you very much, Francesca. Uh, we have about uh, 10 or 15 minutes now uh, for questions. 
So I'll pick up on a few of the questions that were in the chat, and then I see that Sophie has raised her hand, so we will get to Sophie's question as well. But the first question, I think, uh, will be to Cornelio, and then maybe uh, Catherine can also uh, pick up on this. Cornelio, you said, let's look back at past waves of digitalization. And one of the questions in the chat is, when will the metaverse arrive in the third world? Will we see a delay, a digital divide, or maybe uh, some countries in the third world realizing that the metaverse is going to be the next uh, 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 platform of choice? will be early adopters and will actually jump ahead of Western countries. Uh, Cornelio and Catherine, uh, your thoughts. So uh, Cornelio, please. Oh, thank you very much for the question. Um, I think if we apply this, this idea of you know, what we learned from the past, um, I think there are similarities and differences. Uh, but, uh, but social media, what we learn from the social media is that the smaller and uh, medium-sized countries love social media because they could punch diplomatically above their weight and um, um, also, you know, developing country found um, uh, quite useful to, 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 to use uh, social media in a very creative way, exactly for, this, uh, for those reasons. I think that, that, that could be a point of, of parallel that may say that, you know, developing countries may jump on, on, the, on the opportunity of multiverse to do a similar thing. I think that the, the challenge here is, is basically the, the infrastructure. As I mentioned, I mean, in order to be able to do this, this is not social media. This is not about opening a Twitter account or a Facebook account. You need to build an infrastructure. Uh, it's interesting what, what uh, uh, Natalia said, that North Korea is preparing to create its own national multiverse, but Korea has the resources to do this. I think what I think it is more interesting, probably, um, in which to bridge the global South Global Nograd is when international organizations think about UN, think about you know OECD, think about you know uh, other organizations may create that type of multiverse in which they can bring together uh, actually developed and developing countries in various formats, right? Um, and I think UN um, is open, you know, to technology and might be an opportunity here actually to press a case. Uh, for for this kind of um, uh, you know for international organization to take the lead uh, 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 in 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 controlling and actually you know just contrary to what the James uh, uh, said actually to be the first mover for international organization because then it can set the stage and can uh, set the rules of the game uh, for for many that would be my my thought on this. Yeah, I would very much like to, to underscore um, that last point that international organizations might have a role in, in mitigating that digital divide and providing a space for engagement. I mean, the big question is obviously access to the technology and the infrastructure. If you listen to the um, presentation of uh, Mark Zuckerberg, he was kind of emphasizing that some of the technology is meant to be, uh, that they were doing a lot to kind of make it more accessible, giving it away at cost, um, being very conscious of that. And the point here is obviously that a platform like Facebook or the idea of the metaverse like, as introduced by uh, Zuckerberg really depends on users actually being in the space. It depends on engagement and people being in the space. So I think that we will see some efforts from the companies involved in the metaverse and similar ideas to bring in more and more users. And that includes um, users from um, smaller countries, from developing countries. That doesn't take away anything, anything from, from the major problem, which is infrastructure, which is uh, access to technology, which, as we've seen so often, is probably, at least in the first instance, just going to be exacerbated, so a kind of growing digital divide. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Natalia, a question that was raised, which I think maybe you can help us answer, is will the metaverse actually bring about more fair cultural relations. Uh, we've talked about resources right now, but you gave us a very interesting example with South Korea. Do you think that there are other, uh, perhaps uh, more peripheral or smaller countries who may be able to use the metaverse to make the distribution of culture and cultural relations more fair through the metaverse? Yeah, I think this question very much relates to the question that Cornelio and uh, Catherine also just discussed. So uh, it's about the infrastructure and the possibility provided by the governments to cultural institutes to use specific tools, technologies and platforms to push their content forward to the global media space. So our, if we deal with our, uh, the smaller countries with poor infrastructure, uh, we can uh, also uh, you know, identify such a phenomenon as, for example, Google Arts and Culture. 
And on Google Arts and Culture, we have already thousands of museums, for, uh, for instance, including uh, museums from China, which is behind their, you know, the firewall, right? So Google Arts and Culture in the past 10 decades, uh, what they have done, they went to uh, each country and provided for free museums, resources, expertise, and technologies to bring them on this platform. I can see that this will be happening again with the metaverse. The Facebook could do the same, the Google, if they are, you know, come up with an idea to create a global metaverse, and I think they will, they will also, you know, uh, recruit all these museums to do the same. So, and it's uh, the matter of, you know, the resources, again, uh, the major museums or, or the major cultural organizations uh, with a major support from the government, they will probably not be interested because they have other resources to tap on, right? But uh, the smaller ones, they're very interested because this is their chance to go into this global media space and promote their own content, to engage with the audiences, and you know to establish all these connections with other uh, partners. So it's, it's it's the same question about economic resources and infrastructure. So yeah, this is my answer. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Uh, James, a quick question to you before we move uh, to Sophie, because Francesca raised one of the issues that you've been looking at it in your research, and that's disinformation. And indeed, it's amazing to think what the metaverse could do. I mean, the Russian government could send me into their metaverse so I can actually see what is happening in uh, Ukraine, which would be something very different from reality itself. Do you think that the present fear of this information, the present fear of deep fake might actually galvanize MFAs, foreign ministries, to be early adopters and to ensure that they don't make the same mistakes with the metaverse that they did with social media? Um, yeah, I completely agree. I think that was one of the, when I was thinking about like motivations for joining this, this kind of Finding like a security, building a secure multiverse is one of the reasons why you want, might want to be there at the very beginning. Um, the, the problem I can see is when, when there are probably going to be several competing multiverses at the same time, what you might find is certain audiences who want, you know, let, let's, let's say the equivalent of parlor compared to Twitter, like they want an unregulated space to be able to go and say and do whatever they want. They want to have their own tribe, their own um, truths, and sit there and do that um, without any intervention from government or, or any kind of censorship. So I, I, I do fear the idea that there may be either pockets of the metaverse or, or like metaverses that develop over time uh, parallel to one another where they are just these places for you know, conspiracy theories, disinformation, no nothing is checked, nothing is um, censored. It's just pure, unadulterated, you know, disinformation. And, and, you know, taken together with the virtual reality and experiential aspects of that, I mean, it's, it's quite a, a, a chilling thought, I think. Thank you, James. Uh, Sophie, I've spoken for long enough. Now it's your turn, please, if we can hear your question. Thank you so much. Great, great exchange, uh, by the way. I was really excited to, to hear um, your interventions and very stimulating. My question relates to exactly what you just said, uh, James, and the point that was brought up by Francesca, which is the potential external um, negative externalities from, from this development. And more specifically, yes, personal data collection, disinformation, conspiracy theories, and eventually um, increase of inequality and polarization. And since right now these global metaverses seem to be take the lead seem to be taken by giant tech companies like Facebook or Meta, um, I wonder what can we do to avoid this uh, from to 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 prevent this from happening. And one of my uh, question is the prospect of decentralized um, metaverse is to be a potential solution for, for this problem. So I wonder if uh, you have any thoughts on this and by decentralized uh, metaverses, I mean uh, metaverses that would be co-owned 
by use of blockchain technology, or perhaps another solution could be to have metaverses that are transnational and regulated by states. So what are your thoughts on this? Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Francesca. I think that maybe you could take the lead uh, on this question as you raise some of these topics in your discussion of, of AR. So please go ahead. Um, so I think that firstly, I completely agree with the uh, with the potential, with the risk that it would pose in terms of inequalities. And we have to remember that technology is not is never really neutral. So it obviously matters who creates the technology because it's always going to be somehow politicized. So if it is a company in the West um, who creates it, it's obviously going to pose some problems and we have to be aware of that. I think that's the most important thing. And um, in terms of how we could solve that, to be honest, I haven't given much thought to that for now. Um, I think obviously regulation would be uh, the big thing, like kind of, it shouldn't be like the discussion we were having about will this be a public space or will this be a private like who will set the rules so i think it's important that it will be a public space um i don't know what the others think about that um well thank you francesca i would like to know Thank you, Francesca. I, I would like to hear what the others think about it, but unfortunately, uh, we are just about out of time for this discussion. But it is our hope that this is just um, the beginning of a much broader uh, discussion uh, that we were able to facilitate today. And we hope that the people who were here uh, in the audience will take some of the uh, uh, points that we've raised in the discussion and further develop with them, whether in their MFAs or whether they're students or whether they're academics. What is certain is that some metaverse will exist. And as a result, what is also certain is that us as academics and practitioners need to begin anticipating um, and work and trying to understand what this metaverse will be and how it will impact international relations. I want to thank all of the people who joined us in the audience. I want to thank all of our excellent speakers for their insight. I will be bothering you soon with emails asking you to sum up some of your points in words so we can uh, uh, maybe get something down in writing. And also a big thanks uh, to Stuart McDonald and ICR for putting this whole uh, event together. So thank you everyone, and we hope to see you in our future events as well. Thank you. Thank you.